that, that was what it centered around. It centers around the, the, the fruits of the ground, the first fruits. That's what it centered around. But it was, it's always been bigger than that. The Lord got bigger plans than what we're getting out of the ground physically. The Lord got some great spiritual plans. So we're going to get into it. That's the title, How We Get to Pentecost. And really, in a nutshell, the one word answer, first fruits. That's how you get to Pentecost. And we're going to identify exactly what that's about. But that's what it is. And if you're trying to get to Pentecost without dealing with the first fruits, you can't get there. you in error. It's like Jesus said, anybody come any other way but through me, you try to go around, you are a thief and a robber. You can't do it. Deuteronomy, the 26th chapter, how we get to Pentecost, first fruits. And we're going to get into it. Like I said, this is serious business. You know, it might not seem like much to some people. They, oh, we can, you know, y'all did it last week. We do it this week. It's not a real big deal. No, it's a big deal. And that's what we need to understand because there's only one way to serve the Lord. Like Paul told some people in uh, Timothy. He mentioned in 2 Timothy, talk about study to show yourself approved. That's what he was telling somebody that's going to be leading people. You got to make sure you on point because you're going to stand in jeopardy, not just for yourself, but for what if you mislead somebody. He says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why does he have to stress that? Because you can, if you're not on top of things, you will end up ashamed. You will end up with some egg on your face. If you're not rightly dividing the scriptures, that's what he's telling. And then he named some individuals. He said they were to mess you up. They would eat like a canker, as doth Hymenus and Philetus, whatever his name was. He named two of them who he evidently knew. And he said that they have erred from the truth. So this is nothing new that somebody can be walking with you in the truth and then they err from the truth and start doing something different. So like we had a brother jump up. He, 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 he changed and said he wasn't going to keep the feast with us and tried to make a big stink about it. But hey, if you've been doing it the same way we're doing it for 10, 15 years, Really, you shouldn't make no big stink about it. Only thing you should do is just say, look, I made a mistake and I'm changing. But no, nah, he come out trying to act like, well, they, you know, I told them they need to quit messing up. Look, don't worry about nobody else. Because you just changing to do it a different way. So if you got it right, then just focus on dealing with it the right way instead of trying to call yourself throwing somebody else under the bus. See, that don't even, when you do it that way, that don't leave you no room to repent. But again, if you've been doing it a certain way, just like if I'm up here, I've been teaching now on my own 20 years since I left my teachers. 20 years. So if I've been dealing with something for 20 years that's wrong, it, it don't make no sense for me to jump up and be talking about, oh, my teacher's wrong. They dead wrong. Well, I've been wrong for 20 years doing it the same way. I need to just be quiet and try to get it right instead of trying to point the finger at somebody else. That's, that's what Israel don't understand. But now, how we get to Pentecost, first fruits. Deuteronomy 26 and 1. Go ahead. And it shall be when thou art come in unto the land uh -huh. which the Lord thy God giveth thee uh -huh. for an inheritance and possesseth it and dwellest therein that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth. Okay. Now, he said, when you get to the land, notice that's what it's always predicated on. Because at this time, Israel wasn't in the land. They was on their way. They was in the wilderness. The Lord kept telling them, I'm taking you to a land of, of milk and honey. Just like right now, Israel scattered into captivity all over the world. So, we... It need to go back to the land and do everything according to what's written here because we're not in the land. But God is awesome. He had a bigger plan than just these physical fruits right here. 
But he said, when you get and possess the land and dwell therein, I want you to take of the first of all the fruit of the earth. Go ahead. Which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. Uh huh. And shall put it in a basket. Uh huh. You're going to take the first of all the fruit of the earth and you're going to put it in a basket. You're not going to take all the fruit. You're going to take the first of it, which is really the first fruit. Go ahead. And shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose uh -huh. to place his name there. Okay, you're going to go to that place. That place became Jerusalem at a set time. He, he identified it. He, he didn't reveal it right here. That shows you God revealed things in due season. They didn't know the place right here. He hadn't chose the place. He knew what it was going to be, but he hadn't, he hadn't chosen and made it, made it plain. Go ahead. Verse 3. Mm-hmm. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days uh -huh. and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. Uh -huh. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. Okay, so you're going to go to the priest and you're going to acknowledge. See, you're acknowledging that what you got came from the Lord. <clears throat> That's what you do even when you pay tithes or do whatever. You're acknowledging that, hey, you don't have nothing if it don't be for the Lord. That's what you acknowledge. So he said, look, you're going to go to the priest that be in those days and say, I profess this day unto the Lord, thy God, that I am come unto the country of which the Lord swear unto our fathers. And the priest going to take that basket. What was in the basket? The first fruits was in the basket. Out of thine hand, and set it down before the altar, and the priest going to pronounce some, some judgments now and tell you how you got to where you got to and really bless you because this is going to procure you a blessing before the Lord for the harvest to come because you acknowledge in the Lord. That's what this is all about. That's like a brother jumped up and said, well, you know, you know, like, basically, he going to keep the feast going around the calendar. In other words, it's, it's okay to keep it in any season, in winter, or whatever. You going to be, because he called me. I told him, I said, man, you going to be keeping the Passover in January. Well, I don't know. I got to make it up some other way. I'm like, make it up some other way? How you going to make it up some other way? The Lord got a system in place that correlates between the sun and the moon. That's how it's made up. It balances out. So, you know, and they trying to act like, well, you can keep the feast. Look, these feasts centered around harvests. They centered around agriculture. All of them. They was never meant to be kept in what's called winter. Never meant to be kept in that time. It's, that's why it started at what we call the spring, which is the beginning of the year. You can call it summer. It don't matter to me. I know when it is. And it ends... At what we call fall, which you want to call that. That's the beginning of winter, as far as I'm concerned. But that's when it's starting in. Lord, not even concerned with the other five months or so. He's not even concerned with that. Because that's going into the winter. And it's winter all over the place. It's winter in Israel. Israel have winters. Just like anywhere else. It might not be as harsh as here. Just like California don't have Certain places don't have harsh winter like we might have around here, but it's still called winter. So you're going you to announce that you, the Lord can bless you and the priest going to take those first fruits and then we'll skip to verse 10 to save a little time. Go ahead. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, has given me. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. So he said, now, behold, I have brought the, that's what you're going to say. I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, has given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. Verse 11. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee. Uh -huh. And unto thine house. Thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. Notice it was always strangers among Israel. But you're going to rejoice because you're acknowledging the, what the Lord is doing for you. You're acknowledging the blessings. But now go to Exodus 23. 
But that's how, that's what this is all centered around. This is how you get to Pentecost. You can't get to Pentecost no other way but through the first fruits. That's how you get to Pentecost. And we're going to see. It's going to make sense before we're done. Exodus 23 and verse 14. Go ahead, my brother. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. See, we got three feasts to keep. Three feasts to keep. We just, we just going on a little uh, a venture now. Lead, we're not going to deal with Pentecost, Pentecost per se today because we're going to deal with that Sunday. When we meet Sunday, we're going to have a lesson strictly about Pentecost. Really, we're doing the lead up. Because it's a process to get to Pentecost that we need to understand. And being that some brothers and jumped out the window, we just had to make it plain. So you got three feasts. And we know and we're going to see here that Pentecost is the second feast. But go ahead. 15. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee. In the time appointed of the month they bid. Go ahead. For in it thou camest thou from Egypt. Uh-huh. And none shall appear before me empty. Okay, so now you're going to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the first one. That's what we kept approximately two months ago. We kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread, starting with the Passover. Then you had a Feast of Unleavened Bread. Go ahead. And the Feast of Harvest. And notice, after that, it's called the Feast of Harvest. See, you're not having no harvest in the winter. You're not out there working the field in the winter. That's how you know these have particular seasons that they have to be done in. And the Feast of Harvest. This is another name for Pentecost. Pentecost just means 50. We have to point that out. <clears throat> and it's a process to get to the 50th day. And the Feast of Harvest, the what? The first fruits of thy labors. Which thou hast sown in the field. The first fruits of thy life. There go the first fruits again. That's what Pentecost is representing. Uh, the first fruits of thy labor. But in order to get to the Feast of Harvest, which is Pentecost, the first fruits of, of your labors, you need some first of the first fruits in the first place. You need some first fruits early. That's the only way to get to Pentecost. That's the title. How we get to Pentecost, the first fruits. So he called it, he said, you going to keep the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field. So in a nutshell, in order for you to get to Pentecost and deal with the first fruits at Pentecost, you have to have some first fruits in the beginning leading up to Pentecost. That's the only way to Pentecost. So the Lord is saying, look, this, these first fruits that you present before the Lord, that's going to bless you when you get to Pentecost, when you get to these first fruits on Pentecost. That's going to bless these, first, these fruits here. It's because of these fruits in the beginning, though. And it's, it, that might sound funny, but it's going to make sense in a little bit. It's not going to take long. The feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field. What's the last feast? And the feast of end gathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Now, wait a minute. Notice he said, first you got three times. It's only three. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me, the Lord, saying, in the year. The feast of unleavened bread which is kicked off in the beginning with the Passover. We just de dealt with that. Then he said the second one, he said the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labor was thou sown in the field. See, it's about what you done sown in the field. Then he said the Feast of Ingathering. What is that? That's still agriculture, isn't it? It's the last gathering. That's why he called it the Feast of Ingathering. Then he said something else. He said, which is in the end of the year. So that means that's a set time for that to be. It can't be in the beginning of the year. It can't be in the middle of the year, per se. It's the end of the year. But then what used to puzzle me is that I said, why did the Lord say the end of the year? And really, we know the Feast of Ingathering, Feast of Tabernacles, is in the seventh month. 
So that kind of, I said, well, it's five more months. But the Lord not even looking at those months. He's looking at the agriculture season. He's looking at from the beginning of the month, a year, until the seventh month. He climaxed everything in the seventh month. That's the end as far as he's concerned. Because after that, you're going into winter. That's why you understand. That's why we understand that the equinox is what stabilizes things. The equinox, the time evens out around the end of the year, around the seventh month. It'll even out, and the, the days start getting shorter and shorter. That lets you know you're going into winter now. So you have made it to the end of the agricultural season. That's what he taught. He said the end of the year. We know it's the seventh month. It's not the twelfth month, which is the real end of the overall year. That lets you know what he's talking about. But that's the Feast of Engad. We're not dealing with that. I just point that out. Go ahead. Keep reading. 17. Three times in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord thy before the Lord God. Three times. Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Harvest, Feast of Ingather. Also called Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. They got alternate names for, for the, the, the second two. But go ahead. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. Mm-hmm. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Now notice what he said again. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. The Lord is adamant about these first fruits, isn't he? And notice he said the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Go ahead. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Okay, that's good. That means even the kid got to get to a certain age before you deal with him. But now, go to uh, 34, Exodus 34. Kid, which is a goat. So you wasn't even supposed to, whatever you was going to do, even if you was going to do a sacrifice with it, you couldn't do it when it was newborn. If it was still in his mother's milk, that means if it was still nursing, then leave it alone until after that period. But now, Exodus 34, that's where the Edomites got that messed up. They say, well, that means you can't eat milk and cheese or something like that at the same time. They just come up with stuff, so-called Jews. That's what some of the brothers messed up about how to get to Pentecost, listening to them. Because they call themselves keeping Pentecost. They call it Shavuot, Shavuot. And they don't operate according to what the scriptures say. They just base it off Passover. But we're going to get to it. 34 and 22. Exodus 34 and 22. Go ahead. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks. Uh-huh. Of the first fruits of wheat harvest. Uh-huh. And the feast of end gathering at the year's end. See, so he keeps saying the feast of end gathering at the year's end. And we know it's in the seventh month, brother and sister. So that should tell you something. It's at that season, though. It's at the same season. It's not going to change. It's not going to rotate it around the calendar. It's not going to be all over the calendar. He said, thou shalt observe the feast of week. Notice the second one, which he called in the previous scripture, he called the feast of harvest. All these are alternate names for Pentecost. Here he called it the feast of weeks, right? Thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits. There go that first fruits again. And he, he even named the harvest. See, the certain particular harvest has come at a particular time of year all over the place, but these particular, this is about Israel. So we're talking about Israel. So it's common knowledge when the wheat harvest is, it's at this time of year in Israel. It's at this time of year. So, but the way you're going to get to the wheat harvest, you're going to deal with the first of the first fruits, which is early on. Leading up to it. That's why the title is How We Get to Pentecost 
first fruits. That's how we get there. So he said, look, he said, you're going to observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits, the, of the first fruits of wheat harvest. Okay, we got the man here. Hopefully we can get some air going. I just had it on uh, continue to run just to circulate some air because it wasn't doing nothing. But now, he said, you're going to observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So it's a particular harvest we're dealing with. And then he gets to the feast of in God. But now skip to verse 26. Go ahead. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. See, the first of the first fruits of thy land. Thou shalt bring to the house of, notice he keeps saying the first of the first fruits. Because you got to have these to even bless your harvest, period. You're going to bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Go ahead. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Same thing as before. Now go to Colossians 2. See, all this means something, brothers and sisters. All of these, because we're talking about these three holy days, three feasts that you keep. We focusing on the feast of the second one because that's what's Sunday, the feast of weeks, the feast of harvest or Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. And the way you get to 50 from, a, from the first fruits that you, count, that you gather, you are going to count seven weeks and a day. That's how you get to it. But you got to get those first fruits. Without the first fruits, you cannot get to Pentecost, brothers and sisters. You can't get there. That's the key to Pentecost. If you want to have a one word key to Pentecost, first fruits. You can't get there no other way. And see, where brothers are confused at, they listening the way Edom do it. They listen to Edom where, hey, Edom, they don't know, deal with no first fruits, really. They call themselves dealing with, I think, Wednesday. See, this question came up Wednesday night in Bible club, class. I think I might have accidentally said cedar, but they really deal with an omer. They deal with an omer, but they just start counting after Passover. They just count after Passover. And in actuality, it don't have nothing to do with Passover. It has something to do with the first fruits. Jesus is represented in all of them. So that's how they tie in together because of him. But they individual festivals with festivals with their individual meanings. So now we at Colossians 2 and 16. We're gonna see. So we got these three feasts. I'm just pointing out all of them, because they all work in tandem: Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Harvest, or Feast of Weeks, or Feast of End Gathering, which is also known as Tabernacles. What is all this about, though? This is what we need to know first and foremost. Colossians 2 and 16. Colossians 2 and 16. Go ahead. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink uh -huh. or in respect of an holy day. See, don't let no man judge you in meat and drink or in respect of an holy day. Or what? Or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. See, now people have came here to say, oh, you can't judge me about doing Christmas and Easter. He's not talking to you. He's talking to people that's doing what's in the Bible, these Colossians who came out of those pagan rituals that they used to follow, they start serving the God of Israel. Paul was an Israelite who was teaching to them. Paul didn't teach to them to observe Christmas and Easter. Paul taught them to get away from that stuff. That's why he say in Galatians 4, some of them was turning back to some of that folly. He said, look, I'm, you observing certain days and times. I'm afraid of you. I've been laboring in vain. How you turning back to that weak, false God stuff? That's what he said, Galatians 4. So he taught the Gentiles to get away from all their false pagan worship and worship the God of Israel the same way he did and all the other Jews. Because they kept all these holy days. Paul kept these holy days. Read Acts 18. He was, it said he got to keep this feast. Acts 20, he mentioned this feast particularly, the Feast of Pentecost that we're about to celebrate Sunday. He mentioned it point blank in Acts the 20th chapter. He said, I got to be at Jerusalem, the Feast of Pentecost. 
So if it was unimportant, done away with, or as some people even say, they misquote even this chapter right here, that they try to say it was nailed to the cross, why was Paul still keeping it then? So he's not talking to people celebrating false deities and false worship and paganism. He's talking to the Colossians who had came out of that stuff and was keeping the Lord's feast days. And just like it is now, when you do that in an upside down world, people around you going to look at you funny. What you doing? You, you doing that stuff that the Jews do. You ain't got to do that. So that's why Paul said, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath day. See, he's talking about God's stuff. He said, don't let nobody judge you because you're doing that. This is what you need to be doing. Don't let them judge you because you're keeping the Lord's holy days. And what are the holy days about, by the way? 17. Which are a shadow of things to come. See, obviously he's talking about God's plan that's in the Bible. These holy days that we read about. God didn't have you, brothers and sisters, telling you to come up three times in a year, three times a year, just for you to stay busy. God is showing you his magnificent plan. It's a shadow of stuff to come. For instance, we celebrate the Passover. That's, that kicks off the first one. You had a Passover. Then the next day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread that we read about. Now, that's the first one. But is, he didn't just give you that for something back then just to have you doing something. It points to his magnificent plan. That's why when it was time for Jesus to die, what, died, what day do you think he died on? The Passover. So all along, that was a shadow of something good to come, of him coming. It was pointing to it. So let's let you know what we're dealing with here. Let no man judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come. But what? But the body is of Christ. Oh, but the body is of Christ. The body is of Christ. So the the things that we do, and it's a shadow. When Christ comes, he is fulfilling it. That's the real deal. So, it, for example, Exhibit A, killing the lamb from, from ancient Egypt all the way up until the time Jesus came, that was a shadow of Jesus. What is Jesus? Jesus is the body. Hey, he the real deal, in other words. He is the real lamb. That's what that, those lambs were about. Now, we've been reading about we're not dealing with that, but that's what leads into it first. That's what happened first. That had to happen first. But we've been dealing with first fruits, first fruits, first fruits. What you think that is? That's a shadow of things to come because that's another holy. That's what we're talking about right here. His holy days are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So that's what we have to understand. This thing is all about Christ. If you do not recognize Christ in it, if you're not celebrating Christ in it all the way, then you're missing the boat. You're missing the picture. You can't just try to deal with Christ when you feel like it. Now, let's go back and de deal with Matthew 26, just to show you a little bit of what I just was quoting. Matthew 26. Twenty six and one. Because we've been dealing with first fruits, first fruits It's bigger than the fruits that you get out the ground physically. Has great spiritual application. And it's and it's for our benefit, brothers. So twenty six and one. Go ahead. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, <clears throat> You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. See what he said? After two days is the feast of the Passover. He knew he was going to be crucified on that day. Why? Because leading up to him, that was a shadow all along. And being that he is the body, so he had to down that day. And that's a shame. You got so many would-be Christians, they don't even know that the real Christ that you should be worshiped, he didn't die on Good Friday, he died on the Passover. And that's how you honor his death. Not celebrating something Rome gave you, 
The Roman Empire gave you Good Friday and Easter Sunday where Christ died on the Passover in the middle of unleavened bread. And where he died on the Passover, I'm sorry, and he resurrected in the middle of unleavened bread because they was keeping the feast. But he said, after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he knew it because all that was a shadow leading up to him. Now, let's go to Matthew 12 because he told you something with his own mouth. And people try to belittle this and make light of it and act like they can't count to three no more. But this is an important sign that Jesus gave you. This is what most important right here because either you're going to identify and recognize him, who he was, or you're you dealing with somebody else. For instance, when you deal with Good Friday to Easter Sunday, you say he died then and re resurrected then, you're not dealing with this Jesus because this Jesus lets you know how long he was going to be in the grave. And it constituted something when he came out the grave, which we're going to get to. It's going to all come together after a while. Uh, Matthew 12 and 38, go ahead. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. See, they, they was always putting them on the spot because they didn't believe in them, these religious hypocrites. But go ahead. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Uh huh. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. See, so he said, Evil and adulterous generation, y'all looking for a sign. But only one, I'm going to give you one. You want, a, you want a real sign to know. I'm going to give you one of my picks. See, they was trying to put him on the spot. He already doing all kind of miracles, healing people, casting out devil. They seen this stuff, but that didn't make them believe. You know, so they still going to call themselves putting pressure on them. Well, Master, show us a sign now. Let's see you do something, Master, since you, you know, Jesus got sick of their mess. That's why he said an evil and adulterous generation seeketh a sign. But I'm going to tell you, the only sign I'm going to give you is this. You either take this one or leave it. This is the big sign I'm going to give you. Because you're not believing all the other stuff I'm doing. I'm going to give you something that you would never imagine. You want to see a real miracle? I'm going to give you a real miracle. Something you never heard of before. What? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, uh -huh. so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, wait a minute. That's some kind of sign. You understand what he's telling these people? First of all, look, he really letting them know, I'm going to die. I know y'all going to kill me, but guess what? I'm only going to stay dead three days and three That Hey, that's a trick right there. That is a trick right there. He telling them up front because he know exactly how this thing going to go down. Remember, we just read, he said after two days, that was much later from this. It was later on from this point because we were in Matthew 26. He said after two days is the feast of the Passover and the son of man is betrayed to be crucified. So wait a minute. He made it plain that he was going down the Passover. That's not hard to figure out, being that we had to pass over as a shadow all those years, right? That's not even hard to figure out. Okay. See, it's not even like we got to come up with another celebration like Good Friday. We don't have to, because God is omnipotent. He know what he going to do before he do it. So he gave you these shadows to honor him in a van. So when we was keeping the Passover, our ancestors was keeping the Passover before Christ came, they was recognizing Christ. Because it was a shadow of Christ. They was recognizing Christ back then. So it's nothing new. The Lord had them honoring him all those years. And then finally, when you have a shadow, there's a body that go with that shadow, isn't it? So the body came. Christ came himself and fulfilled it down to the last I being dotted and T being crossed. He died on the Passover. But now he's telling us something else. He said, the sign that I'm going to give you, you want to see a miracle. I'm going to show you a real miracle and see if you go for this one. And this is the one you better take heed to. What is it? He said, 
Read 40 again. We had uh, Matthew 12 and 40. Go ahead. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, mm -hmm. so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said, just as Jonas, and you can look up Jonas in the Old Testament, he was literally in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. And see, the Lord got specific. Some days it just, some scriptures just say three days. I'm, you know, he's going to rise after three days. He's going to rise the third day. But to clarify things, because he knew people would try to confuse the issue and come up with all kind of lies, he made it plain here. And you don't get no plain than this, brothers and sisters. And it's amazing. You got some Israelites recognize this one day, then all of a sudden they can't count to three. They don't know what three. Well, see, you know, it wasn't really three days and three. What the heck are you talking about? How are we going to get anything else? You know, you can, you can kind of you can kind of try to finagle if you just say three days. You can try to finagle that. Well, that, you know, he just said three days, so we don't know what time, how, when. But he got real specific, brothers and sisters. He said, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Not three days and four nights. Not four nights and three days. Not from Good Friday to Sunday, because guess what? Good Friday evening, which they say he died and rose early to Sunday, that's really only one day, which the only day you can legitimately count from Friday evening to Sunday morning to Saturday. That's the only day part you can count. Because you can't count Friday if you tell me he died Friday evening, which it was an evening. It just wasn't a Friday. He died. You say he died and was buried Friday evening. You can't deal with Friday as a day. And if you say he rose early Easter Sunday morning, which he didn't, but that's what they say. You can't count Sunday as a day because if he rose before the day was even gone. And he's talking about Days and nights. He give you the full spectrum of things. You can't count, you know, parts of it and say, well, you know, he, you know, you just count Sunday. Because no, he he's giving you the full spectrum. Three days and three nights. So if he went in in the evening, which he did, he got to come out toward the evening to make an equal amount of days and nights. So and this, so I, I don't know how people turn around and mess this up. Three days and three nights. But the big thing is, the big sign is that he going to do that. He's telling them, this is, a, you want a sign? I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you a real trick. This is one you better believe. I'm going to, just like Jonas, I'm going to be in the grave for three days and three. That means he's telling them, I'm going to get up. And guess what that constitutes? This is the first fruits we're looking for. See, we don't need the fruits of the earth. That's not what this is about. Remember, that's a shadow. Christ is the real first fruits. He is the body of this thing. Now, let's look at it. Let's go back to Leviticus 23, and we're going to get real specific with it because that's what you need. You need the first fruits, brothers and sisters, to get the Pentecost. If you don't have no first fruits, if you're not acknowledging no first fruits, you can't get to Pentecost. You can't make it to Pentecost. And when Pentecost get here, which is really pointing to the year the Lord is going to come back, you're going to be in trouble. You can't get around Jesus. 23 and 4. Go ahead. These are the feasts of the Lord, uh -huh. even the holy convocations, uh -huh. which ye shall proclaim in their season. Notice, it's a season for them. You proclaim these in their seasons, brothers and sisters. These are holy get-togethers, holy gatherings, holy convocation. That means these are, these are special occasions to God, holy. In their seasons, though, that means it's a set time of the year. It's a season for. Well, how you know seasons? The Lord gave you the sun and the moon for times, days, years, and seasons. He gave you that. You can't just count days and say, well, you, you know, you just go around and just count some days or count some months. 
No, he gave the sun and the moon for seeds as well. It's in a season. Go ahead. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. In the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. What? That Passover that was a shadow of Christ. The same Passover Christ came a thousand years later from when this was announced and died on that day. He said, two days, I'm going to die on the Passover. Told him in advance. Then we read, he had already told him, I'm going to come out the grave. I'm only going to be in the grave for three days and three nights. And I'm coming back. Just like Jonas. That's some heavy stuff. But go ahead. Verse 6. Mm -hmm. And on the 15th day of the same month, is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now this is the first festival. Now pay attention that this is a festival all of itself. Passover is one. It kicks it off. It's intertwined with the unleavened bread, but really it's, it's distinct. It's just the day before. Then unleavened bread kick off for seven days. Go ahead. In the first day, ye shall have an holy convocation. That's the first day of unleavened bread. Go ahead. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Uh-huh. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Uh-huh. Seven days. Go ahead. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Now, that's the seventh day of unleavened bread. Go ahead. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Okay. Now, pay attention, brothers and sisters. When you get to verse 8, which he just read, we done with that festival. Remember, it's three festivals, brothers and sisters. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, which is also named the Feast of Weeks. And we're going to see why in a second, why he called it the Feast of Weeks. And then you got the Feast of Ingathering, which is also called Tabernacle. Those are the three festivals. Unleavened Bread, Harvest, which is Pentecost or Weeks, and Tabernacles. Those are the three. So they distinct one from another. So when he finished verse 8, that was a wrap on that first festival. We done with that. Now go ahead to verse 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. See, that's why it come in again. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Because he's he telling him a whole nother deal now. He tell, he started over. That's why I jumped back in. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Saying, what did he say this time? Go ahead. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. When ye be coming to the land which I give unto you, uh -huh. and shall reap the harvest thereof, uh -huh. then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest now unto the, the priest. Now the first thing, the most important thing to understand why brothers is confused now, and that I need to impress upon you, is that verse 9 and 10 don't have nothing to do with the previous. It don't have nothing to do with unleavened bread or Passover, or none of that. And I say that because that's what people have listened to Edom. Edom started counting the Pentecost immediately after Passover. They start counting the Pentecost. They think it hinges on Passover when in actuality, Pentecost didn't have nothing to do with Passover. They are distinct. Passover and unleavened bread, that's... That's when you got the first festival, and now you got the second festival. So if it didn't hinge on Passover and unleavened bread, how do we get to Pentecost? That's the question, right? Well, what did he say again? Verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, uh -huh. when ye be coming to the land. First, you got to get to the land, which we didn't read that repeatedly. Go ahead. Which I give unto you. Uh-huh. And shall reap the harvest. And thereof. reap the harvest because it's the feast of harvest. That's what Pentecost is. So this is what it's about. How you going to make it hinge on Passover then? Go ahead. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Then you going to bring a sheaf. Once you reap the harvest, you going to bring that bundle, which he sold them like, you know, you put it in a basket, you take it to the priest. You're going to bring that bundle of your first fruits unto the priest. Once you reap the harvest, the first fruits of your harvest, this is what it's about. That's why the title is, brothers and sisters, how we get to Pentecost first fruits. Can't get there no other way. Then what? Verse 11. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. 
On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. See, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest going to wave that bundle. That's what a sheaf is that you brought. Because you're not going to take all your harvest to him. You're going to take the first of the first fruits to him. And he's going to take it and he's going to wave it before the Lord. When he's going to do it? On the morrow after the Sabbath. Did he say any particular Sabbath? Some brothers say, well, that's the Sabbath doing unleavened bread. It didn't say that. See, that's when you start adding to the word when you want to substantiate some lie you didn't came up with. It didn't say nothing about unleavened bread. didn't say nothing about Passover because that's the route when you get down here. It's contended on one thing, and that's at verse 10, when you reap the harvest. See, and that, that's going to vary. Now, being that he's talking about the first harvest at the beginning of the year, it's during that season of unleavened bread and Passover, but it's not based on that. It's based on when you reap the harvest. Whenever you reap it, you get the bundle, you give it to the priest, and he going to wait until the following day after the following Sabbath, whatever that is, whenever it is. Say you reap the harvest on a Tuesday, he not going to just wave it on Wednesday, you take it to him on Thursday. He's not going to do that. He is, he is specified. He must wait until the morrow after the Sabbath to wave it. That's when he got to do it because this thing got to start on the first day of the week. This is how you get the Pentecost. It must start. I'm saying this. I'm stressing this because the Edomites, after Passover, they say, look, we got the Omer, which is a measurement of weight. They say we got the omen, which we're talking about barley. See, this is the harvest that come at the beginning of the year doing unleavened bread. This is the first harvest. See, all these feasts are centered around harvests. So the first harvest doing unleavened bread during that season at the beginning is barley. Now, barley lay dormant over the winter, and it come up right at the beginning of the year. So it's out there, but it don't spring up until the weather change and you, your year begins. At the beginning of the year, it springs up. And you get that barley, you get a bundle of it, and you take it to the priest, a bundle of your first fruits, and when he get it, he going to wave it tomorrow after the Sabbath. Now, this is going to start your count to Pentecost. And then when you get down to Pentecost, you're going to have a blessed wheat harvest. Because they all centered around harvests. All of them. So, that's why he said it. At verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, skip to verse uh, 15 and go ahead. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. See, we just skip the same time because this way it really connect that. Because he just pick it up. Because again, the title is how we get to Pentecost, first fruits. And he said, and ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from what? From the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Oh, now we're going our way to Pentecost, brothers and sisters. We're going to count from that day, seven weeks or seven Sabbaths. That's why it's called the Feast of Weeks. You should start to understand this now. It's called the Feast of Weeks. But you got a process to complete till you get to this blessed day at the end of the road, which is 50. That's what Pentecost means. Pentecost is a Greek word that means 50. The English version of it is simply when they break it down and say feast of weeks. That's the English version of it. Just feast of weeks. Seven weeks, one day. We ain't, we ain't got the one day yet. We just read verse 15. You should count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall ye complete. So now you're going, from that day that you brought the wave off, you're going to count seven Sabbaths. But what allowed you to have that wave offering reaping the harvest? Did we see anything contingent on Passover, unleavened bread when it came to this festival? Not at all. 
He didn't say the day after Passover. See, brother saying they, they going around saying, see, y'all adding three days and three days. Three days and three nights to the law. Look, for you to tell me I'm adding something, you need to have a basis. You don't have no basis if you don't have no first fruits. You don't have no basis. So you cannot say that something is being added. You don't know what the process is. See that? So you are forming a phantom basis. Saying it got to be after Passover. You add to the word. It doesn't say nothing about Passover. It said when you reap the harvest. Bring that to the priest. That's what it's contending on. We talking about first fruits. Not Passover. Not unleavened bread. First fruits. When you reap that harvest, you take it to the priest. And you deal with it. So, like I said, either my... Uh, Gentile was asking us, well, how y'all do it? How y'all do it? I said, hey, we deal with the first fruits. We know that's Jesus. That's what this is all about. We know that's Jesus. So we base it on really what it's about. Since he is the body, all this is a shadow of him. We base it on him. But they try to say, no, no, you adding something. Look, you, you don't have no foundation. You don't have anything. You don't have no first fruits. But now, keep, uh, what verse you at? 16? 16. Mm -hmm. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days. See, notice it have to be 50 days. Even You count seven Sabbaths, seven weeks. That's why it have to start on the first day of the, of the week, brother and sister, because it's going to be exact. It's not going to be uh, just any amount of days. It's going to... By the time you get to the first week, the first Sabbath, you got seven days because you start at one, you get to seven. You get to second Sabbath, you got 14, and so forth and so on. Till you get to seven of them, you got exactly 49 days. That's why that moon floating Sabbath don't work because they try to say, well, you just do it according to the month. Look, you can't get 50 days in seven Sabbaths according if you, if you operated the Sabbath according to the moon cycle. It wasn't based on the moon cycle because you... You have getting from one Sabbath to another at the end of the month. You have eight, nine days. Then it will no longer be the seven-day Sabbath. But that's another thing. Whenever somebody's in error, you can see where they're erring at because it won't add up. You have to have 49 days, and then you add the next day, and you go to the first day of the week, you're going to number 50 days. And then he said, you're going to offer a new meat offering to the Lord. See, this is where you was getting to. Go ahead. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Go ahead. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of the two-tenth deal. Uh-huh. They shall be of fine flour. Mm -hmm. They shall be bacon with leaven. What are they? They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Wait, they are the first fruits unto the Lord. See? What made these first fruits possible, brothers and sisters, was the first fruits that you offered 50 days ago. That's what made these first fruits. See how this thing is all about first fruits. Now we made it to Pentecost. We ain't going to even deal with Pentecost so much today because we're going to deal with it Sunday. We're just showing you how you get there. But when you get there, you make an offer. It's, these are first fruits again. See, this is representing us. But now skip to verse 20 and go ahead. Skip to verse 20 and go ahead. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruit. See, that now the priest going to wave them. This is on Pentecost now. See, it started off 50 days earlier with the first of the first fruits. Then it climaxed on this 50th day. And the priest going to wave this before the Lord with the bread of the first fruit for what? For a wave offering before the Lord uh -huh. with the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. See, they're going to be holy to the Lord for the priests. This is serious business, but go ahead. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. Now, this is the Sabbath day. All this stuff leading up to it wasn't Sabbath day, the weeks that counting. This is just how you get to this great day, the Feast of Pentecost. The 50th day is what, is what it's all about. But this is how you get there. We got to go over how you get there because people just think they can get there any kind of way. They can just start arbitrarily counting after Passover. 
and you don't have no, you don't have first fruits then. Like I was, t- I was telling the Gentile, I said, look, you know, the only way you could do it, they were saying, well, we kind of just do it this way. I say the only way you could do it, because he said, well, we do it according to the law, and y'all adding three days and three nights, and we're going to get to that. I said, look, you're not doing it according to the law, because in the law it said get the first fruit. You need to be in Israel and get the first fruit. Then when you get that, you need to find you a priest. And take it to him. And then they holler and say, no, nah, we got Jesus for that. I said, bingo. That's what I've been trying to tell you. We got Jesus for all of it. Jesus is the first fruits. So I don't have to worry about we not in Israel anyway. And being that I know Jesus is the first fruits, I don't have to call nobody over there and see when the barley coming up. I don't have to do that. It was contingent on Israel being in the land anyway. Just like I don't have to get no lamb and kill it because I know who the real lamb is. I know that's Jesus. So if you don't have no first fruits, the only way you could possibly do it is have some physical first fruits and do it exactly like that. Then you got to find you a priest and he got to take it once it come up and he got to wave it on the morrow after the Sabbath Then you'll be doing according to the law. Anything else, you're just fooling yourself. You can't just take part of it. Now, let's go further. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 16. We're going to make sure it's it's clear. I'm sorry, you didn't finish it? Yeah, read read 21. I'm sorry. You shall do no servile work therein. Mm -hmm. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generation. See, that's the high Sabbath which is the Feast of Weeks. That's the day of Pentecost. That's the high Sabbath. Matter of fact, skip over, right? we here, just skip over to verse uh, 23 because when he go to something else, I'm going to show you what he say. Go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. Now, he's like he's starting all over again because now he's about to go to the next festival, which is what? Keep reading. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, uh, uh-huh. in the seventh month, in the first day of the month. Okay, so now we at the memorial of the blowing of the trumpet. We're not going to read it. I'm just showing you when he go to something else, he going to something else. The way you calculate getting the memorial of the trumpets don't have nothing to do with what you just did with Pentecost. The memorial of the trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. Matter of fact, skip over to verse uh, 26 and go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses. See, saying, every time he get to the next holy day, he start over again. See, this is further evidence that Feast of Weeks calculating getting to Pentecost has absolutely nothing to do with Passover and unleavened bread in actuality. You can't just arbitrarily start counting the Pentecost the day after Passover. You need some first fruits. And if you don't have no physical first fruits, which the Lord fixed it, you, you, your only choice is to deal with really what it's about. And that's the real first fruits in the first place. Jesus himself. But go to uh, Deuteronomy 16 now. Deuteronomy 16. See, before, before brothers need to, before they jump up and start changing some, they need to really investigate because this is serious business. Sixteen and nine. Go ahead. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Okay, you gonna number seven weeks. We on our way to Pentecost. That's what it takes. Seven weeks and a day. So seven weeks you gonna number unto thee, right? Let's see when you start. Do you start the Sunday after Passover or what? Go ahead. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Oh, you don't just, he's not even mentioning Passover at all. This is going to start your account to Pentecost. How are you going to get to Pentecost? How are you going to number them seven weeks? When you start to reap the harvest. When you put the sickle to the corn, you got to get some first fruits. See, at least the Gentile tried to say, well, we, you know, we go over there. We got some people in the land and they tell us when the barley is right. At least he tried to halfway do it, but I still messed him up. I said, what priest are you going to take it to now? Oh, 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 we got Jesus. I said, well, then you had him in the first place. You should have understood that you didn't have to worry about the barley over there because it's all about Jesus anyway. It's all about him in any way. 
The Lord will fix everything back how it was once Israel get back to the land. But right now, we got the spiritual application anyway. He said, you began to number seven weeks. You going to keep the feast of weeks? What was that? He said, uh, seven weeks shall thy number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such a time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. This is the, when you reap the harvest, you're going to get the first fruits. You're going to take them to the priest. That's when it starts. If you don't do that, you're playing with yourself. Go ahead. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks. See, now you're going to keep the feast of weeks. Go ahead. Unto the Lord thy God mm -hmm. with the tribute of a, free <clears throat> of a free will offering of thine hand. Uh-huh. Which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God. Uh-huh. According. See, see, now, a lot of these preachers, I've seen them come in and read this. They don't tell nobody nothing about Pentecost. That got nailed to the tree, supposedly. They say that got nailed to the cross. You know, we ain't got to keep Pentecost. Week, but they come here to get some money. So he said, you're going with a free will offering of thine hand. Bring it to the Lord. They just trying to get some money. They ain't going to really read and tell you what this is about. They going there for their own benefit. But this is talking about this great festival that shows you how to honor God to recognize his great plan for us. This is how we getting saved. See, we're going to understand what these first fruits is really about. It's not about the literal corn. It's about some spiritual corn. That's what it is. It's of utmost importance what we're dealing with here. He said, you're going to keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God. Go ahead. According as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. According as he didn't bless thee. You, you don't have to do more than what you able. You do according to what the Lord didn't bless you. If the Lord didn't bless you with a lot, then you will give a bigger portion than somebody that had been blessed with a little. Go ahead, verse 11. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God. See, you, the Lord going to bless you. See, the Lord is showing you how to get blessed. See, preachers have that right. When you operate... Recognize that whatever you got, you got it from the Lord, and you honor the Lord with it, then the Lord is going to bless you. The only problem, he ain't going to bless you for giving none to no false prophet who deceiving you, and you helping him deceive other people, you working for the devil now. That's what they forget to tell you. But when you really doing it right, somebody's showing you what thus said the Lord. That's why Paul told the Gentile, look, if you've been giving your money to other people who lying to you, hey, we are definitely more worthy to receive it. You've been giving it to somebody lying to you. That's what we can tell people come out of these false churches. We, we're not even up here begging for money. But, hey, we at least working for the Lord and showing you how to get salvation. That's what he said, though. He said, you're going to rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant, thy maidservant. And the Levite that is within thy gates. And what else? And the stranger. Always with strangers there. Hebrews want to kill the stranger, but they was there. And the stranger. What else? And the father. And to the father. See, the Lord look out for those who need looking out for. Who else? And the widow. Uh-huh. That are among you. Go ahead. In the place which the Lord thy God have chosen to place his name See, there. See, the same place which became Jerusalem. That's why once it was known, they went to Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians. Now, all this been leading up to, the, to, to where we at now. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to pick it up at verse 20. First Corinthians 15 and 20. Go ahead. But now is Christ risen from the dead. But now is Christ risen. See, it had to be fulfilled at some point or another. Because all of this stuff leading up to Christ, he said the holy days, the Sabbath day, that's a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So now when we get to 1 Corinthians 15, he said, but now is Christ risen from the dead. And what does that signify? And become the first fruits of them that slept. Oh, wait a minute. We got some real first fruits. 
We got the body now. We got what this thing is all about. All the acknowledging of those first fruits was pointing us to this all along. Lord telling you a great master plan. We're not talking about no literal fruits from the ground. That was did, that was done as a shadow, wasn't it? But when Christ, the body come, just like killing the lamb, killing the lamb, killing the lamb every year, that was a shadow of Christ being killed. That's why Christ come and died right on the Passover. Not a day before, not a day after, on the Passover. Because he is the body. And he resurrected after he died on the Passover. We know we got a date that he resurrected because he pinpointed when he would be resurrected. He gave us a, a, a stamp letting us know when he would be resurrected or in other words, when he would become the first fruit from the dead. We don't even have to guess about it, brothers and sisters. We know exactly when it is. He said he's going to be in the ground three days and three nights. That lets you know if he died on the Passover, he resurrected three days and three nights later. We cannot get the Pentecost without him being resurrected as the first fruit, being that that's what it's based on. The only other way you could do it is go get you some literal fruits from over in, in Israel, and you out of pocket doing that anyway. But at least you're trying to do it according to the law. Just counting arbitrarily don't get it, brothers and sisters. Just picking a date and start counting. That's what they say, well, y'all adding three days. Look, that, that statement is saying you already got a basis in the first place. You have no basis without first fruits. You don't have no first fruits. You don't have no basis to say, see, we not add nothing. We starting with the first fruits. Who are the first fruits? Christ. When did he become the first fruits? Three days and three nights after the Passover. That's the only way. This is what this thing is about. Read it again. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead uh -huh. and become the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first fruits of them that slept. This is bigger than getting some first fruits of the corn and the barley and all of that. This is bigger than that. He's the first fruits of them that slept, came out the grave. That's why that was a magnificent sign. You talking about a miracle. They want to see him heal somebody or open a blind eye. So I'm going to do something bigger than that. I'm going to be in the grave three days and three nights. And I'm going to be up. Go run and tell that. This is what he's letting them know. And he did it after three days and three nights. Matter of fact, back up to verse, I didn't have this on here. Back up to verse, because uh, he's he telling you about this whole thing. Back up, we're going to read a little bit. Verse 1, just back up to verse 1. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received, uh -huh. and wherein ye stand, uh -huh. by which also ye are saved. You are saved. People want to jump on that. Oh, see, we say, but it's a big stipulation here. It's a big little word called if. By which also you are saved, what? If. If. Yes. See, that's a big word. So that means you're not automatically say it's contingent on what come after if. If what? If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. What if I don't? Unless you have believed in vain. If I don't, I'm not going to be saved, that one. Because you don't say if unless it's a possibility. And if I don't, I would all my belief up until that point where if I don't stay with this thing, if I don't keep it in mind and do what I need to do, then all my belief will be have been in vain. So, so much for being saved automatically. Saved is a process that got to be completed. Keep reading. Verse 3. Mm -hmm. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Uh-huh. He said, I, I didn't come up with nothing new. That's what, that's what we're doing here. We're not teaching. This stuff been in the Bible. We're not coming up with nothing new. I'm not trying to figure out nothing new. Because it's all spelled out in the scriptures. Go ahead. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh-huh. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. According to the scripture. See, all this is telling you the same thing. He rose again the third day. See, that's why he specified, because you could say, well, he rose the third day. You can just count three days and say he rose on that day. Well, really, in actuality, we know it was a full three days. It was after three days. So you had completed three days, in other words. 
Because he made it clear in one particular place, because he knew people would mess it up. He said he was going to be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So it's the third day, but it's a complete three days been done when he rise that third day. It's over. He didn't completed them. Three, four days, including the nights, was done. So again, you keep having that sign. See, this was according to the scripture because he had to resurrect. He couldn't even be in the grave. You know, the scripture said he in, in uh, Psalm 16, I heard a brother saying, well, you know, why he gave you the sign three days? Because, uh, you know, he knew he had to come out the, 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 the Sunday after Passover. That's a lie. That's not even in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. He gave you the sign of three days and three nights. Because he couldn't be in there no longer because decay and rotten start to come set in on, on the body. You start to decompose any, any longer. And he said it's written in Psalm 16. He said he would not suffer his holy one to see corruption. So he's not going to even decompose. He's not going to be in there long enough to decompose and start rotting like the normal person that died. You're not going to even be in there that long. And being that he is the first fruits, he had to come up from the dead to start it off in order to get us to Pentecost. And being that he died on the Passover, he had to come up three days and three nights later. But now go ahead. We're going to get back to where we was at. Go back to verse 20. Go ahead. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, he's the first fruits of them that slept. That means it's going to be some more. But when are the more coming on Pentecost? See, that wave shelf offering that you took to the priest, you took those first fruits to the priest, and he waved it tomorrow out to the Sabbath, that's still for Christ. And then you start counting the Pentecost, and you're going to have some blessed. More first fruits, that stand for us. See, if you're the first of something, that means it's going to be some more. That's why this is important. See, Christ paved the way for us. We couldn't be blessed when Pentecost get here if it wasn't for Christ. That's why Pentecost is the blessed celebration. Everything else was leading to it. Christ paved the way for us. That's why I say he is the first fruits of them that slept. If he's the first fruits, you got some more and you even got some more first fruits because he's the first of the first fruits. That's why when we come back, brothers and sisters, what is it called? The first resurrection. Even though he already resurrected, but he's the first of the first. That's why we keep saying the first of the first fruits, the first of the first fruits. That had to be accepted. He had to be accepted by the Lord for us. And no coincidence, he died three days and was in the grave for three days and three nights. And he rose. Saturday evening, we understand, and he did not get accepted until that Sunday, that first day of the week. He had saw Mary, and he told her, hold on, don't touch me yet. I got to extend to my father because he, he had to be accepted on that day. He, he hadn't been accepted yet at that point. But now, keep going. 21. Mm -hmm. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. See, this is what this thing is all about, brothers and sisters. It's bigger than, it's bigger than some first fruits of barley. The barley is a shadow of Jesus. This thing is all about Jesus. That's why we need to know who we're dealing with. But since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's Jesus. Go ahead. For as in Adam all die, mm -hmm. even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Shall all be made alive. Started with Christ, the first of the first fruits, you get to seven weeks, that signifies the coming of the Lord when you get to Pentecost, that 50th day. That's why it's also not just a day of Pentecost we celebrate this Sunday. It's also a year of Pentecost that's, that was celebrated every 50 years. Every 50 years, a year of Pentecost, because Christ is coming in the year of Pentecost. That's when he's coming. And that's when we coming back. People talking about, well, you know, you died. They went to heaven. They ain't died and went nowhere. They got to wait on Pentecost. 
Christ is the first. Notice what he said. He's going to make it plain right here. You, you can even read this when somebody tell you they loved one, then died and went to heaven. Uh-uh. What did he say here? 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit. Uh-huh. Afterward, they that are Christ said his coming. Notice it's an order to this. Every man in his own order. It's an order to it. Christ the first fruits. And then 50 days later, you had the other first fruits, which is Pentecost. That represent us. So that's why he said, they that are Christ that belong to him, in other words, at his coming. So nobody is coming back before then, brothers and sisters. Nobody went nowhere before then. If you honor the Lord, you will come back at his coming. That's what it just said. We're we, we going to deal with the full story on Pentecost Sunday. Go to Numbers 28. Numbers 28. But you cannot get to Pentecost. You cannot get the 50th day without the first fruits, brothers and sisters. And being that we know it's bigger than some physical first fruits, Israel in slavery now, we ain't dealing with the physical first fruits anyway, but we know it's bigger than that. The real first fruits is Christ. And we know when he became. So this is where the confusion come in. I'm just going to break it down to you. This is where the confusion come in. You got some brothers that done got smart. They've been following, doing the way it's supposed to be done for years. And now all of a sudden they got too smart for themselves. They said, well, you know, when Passover comes, so if say Passover is on a... This year, I forgot what it was, Thursday or Friday. But just say it. Just say it's on a, a Friday. Because it, it come different days of the week. And that show you something. You don't just, you can't make it happen like it happened the year that Jesus died. Because it don't, it don't happen that way. We can't change it to fit what we think. So in other words, my point is, you keep the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, it don't matter what day of the week is. That's, that has no bearing. You can't change it. See, the year that Christ died, it, they would have kept the Passover that Tuesday night. He would have been buried the following evening, that Wednesday evening. He would have been in the grave until Saturday evening. And he came up Saturday evening and he still wasn't accepted. He hung out and did whatever he did. Time ain't nothing for an immortal. So it ain't like he was bored for 12, whatever the hours was, 12, 16 hours, whatever it was, before he went ascended to the Father. So he rose Saturday evening, and he had to be accepted on the morrow after the Sabbath. We're going to deal with it more thoroughly Sunday. So that's how it happened that year. But being that, we don't, just because it, he died, it would have been and buried on a Wednesday evening. We don't just celebrate the Passover on the same day. We celebrate it when it come. So whatever day it come in, that's when we celebrate. So whatever day he would resurrect on, that's when he became the first fruits. So, but some brothers say, well, you know, you just do it, you know, so say he, Say he really, we kept the Passover, which represent his death. We honored his death on a, you, he would have been buried. We kept it Thursday. Just say we've been buried Friday evening. Okay, that's the Passover. We can't just arbitrarily say, okay, we got the Passover because we didn't read nothing about the Passover when it talked about first fruits. So we just go to the first Sunday, tomorrow after the Sabbath, and recognize that as the offering of the first fruits. We can't do that because if he died at, on a Thursday or, or buried on a Friday uh, evening, he had to be in the grave three days and three nights. We have to understand he cannot be the first fruits until he would have been resurrected. So if we honor the Passover on the day that he would have died that year, you still, you can't deal with no first, you don't have no first fruits until he resurrected. So that's the issue. So just say if, because see, this is how the real first fruits would have worked, brother and sister. It was no particular day of the week that you was going to reap your harvest and get your first fruits and take it to the priest. He didn't give you no day of the week. He didn't say it got to be on the week. It's whenever they come and you reap the harvest. So I'm absolutely sure that took place on any day of the week, right? Because we're talking about 
something that's variable. It's going to vary. Reaping the harvest. It ain't no set time. You can say, oh, it's Wednesday. I'm going to reap the harvest every year. No, it wouldn't have been that way. It would have been when, and whenever you reap the harvest, you got your first fruits, you take them to the priest. But being that Christ is the harvest, you have to wait till the time he would have been out the grace since he the first fruits. That's the, that's the signal when he would have been out the grave. You can't just start from the Passover because he just was dying and being buried. And he didn't tell you to count out to the Passover. That's something Edom told you. So that's why. So if he would have been the first fruits on a Monday, if he would have been the first fruits on a Monday, then you wait until the following first day of the week, day after the next Sabbath, to start your count and where the first fruits would have been weighed. Because that's the way it is. You can't just say, well, you know, we just going to do it that previous one. You don't have first fruits. But now, go. what I said, Numbers 28 and 26. Read that one verse. Also in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, uh -huh. after your weeks be out, uh -huh. you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Now, notice again. He said, also in the day of the first fruits, now we're talking about Pentecost because we didn't count it seven weeks. That's why he said, you're going to bring a new meat offering unto the Lord after your weeks be out. See, so you started with first fruits, which is Christ, and you counted seven weeks. That's why it always had to start on the first day of the week. Whenever you reap the harvest, you got to go to the first day of the week to start the count. That's when he would be weighed. You're honoring this stuff like it's written. And you count seven Sabbaths and you go to one more day, the 50th day. Now you got the big celebration of the rest of the first fruits. That's representing of us coming out the grave. Christ is the first fruits afterwards, them that are his that is coming. He's the first fruits of them that slept. So he came out so we can come out the grave. So also in the day of your first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out. Notice this. Uh, now we're talking about Pentecost. That's when your weeks are out. That's when you have the holy convocation. See, you didn't have no holy convocation at the beginning of this thing. You didn't have one on the, on the day that you brought the way chef offering to start the count. That wasn't a holy day. Some Hebrews start saying, well, that's a celebration. Look, it wasn't a holy day. The priest had to do his thing. That was it. It wasn't no holy convocation. It wasn't no Sabbath day. This is you on your way somewhere. That's why the title is How We Get to Pentecost, First Fruits. That's how you start getting to Pentecost. You make that offering to the Lord on the morrow after the Sabbath. You count seven weeks. After your week's out, you got this great celebration of Pentecost because, hallelujah, we are going to be blessed. Now, go to uh, Romans 8. Let's show you that. See, it don't call Christ the first fruits. For nothing, it called him the first fruits because he's looking forward to us coming after him. Romans 8. So this is what this thing is about. It's not about getting some fruits out of the ground. That was the shadow. This thing is about Christ. So when Hebrews talking about, well, you don't see no three days and three nights in the law. Look, Christ is the law. This thing is all about him. I don't see no three days and three nights in the law. I, well, I really don't see what you're talking about just starting that Passover. That ain't in the law. But Christ is the law. And we know Christ died on the Passover and rose three days and three nights later. So... I don't see no bread and wine in Leviticus where he said keep the Passover. But you doing that, right? Because you understand that the Passover is really about him. Even though you don't see that in Leviticus when he talked about the Passover. But you do it because Christ is the law giver. He's establishing law with what he is doing and saying. He's fulfilling this thing. 
that those things were a shadow. Christ is the body. So he's establishing the law. That's how we know who the first fruits are. Romans 8 and 23. Go ahead. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. See, that's all we got now. We are not the first fruits. We waiting to be the first, first fruits when he come back on Pentecost, the year of Pentecost, that is. See, the day of Pentecost actually points to the year of Pentecost. We're going to deal with that on Pentecost. But we waiting. But the best we got now is having the spirit. He said, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. See, he's telling you we got the first fruits of the spirit, but that's not what it's about. That's only a temporary blessing. Because you, you still going to die and need to be resurrected as first fruits for, at the first resurrection. So not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. There go that term again, though. Go ahead. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves. Even though, he said, look, even though we got the Spirit, we got the first fruits of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we groaning within ourselves. We waiting on something. We waiting on Pentecost. We're in the interim. We count weeks now. Go ahead. Waiting for the adoption. Waiting for the adoption to what? To wit, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body. Our body got to be redeemed. When you start getting a little older, you know your body needs to get redeemed. Like I say all the time, now, you get a little older, don't have to get too old either. Body be hurting for no reason. Just sit down too long. How can you sit down too long and be hurting? Be standing up. Oh, oh, what? You ain't did nothing but sit down. Got to stretch stuff, be popping. Because your body needs to be redeemed. This old body was meant to die once Adam sinned. It was on his way to death. It needed to be redeemed. That's why Christ went through this. For, but he was showing us all along with the first fruits of the ground. You bring those first fruits, that will bless you your harvest on Pentecost when you get the rest of the first fruits. So he said, we waiting. We waiting for the dust. Don't matter. See, people say, oh, I'm full of the spirit. I'm full of spirit. Most of them lying, but that's still not what the goal is. That's good for now. You need the spirit to follow God, but that's only good for now. You need your body redeemed in the long run. Because we waiting for the dust until with the redemption of our body. Let's cut to it. Verse 29. Go ahead. For whom he did foreknow. That's us. Go ahead. He also did predestinate uh -huh. to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, we trying to be conformed to the image of his son. The son is the first fruits of them that slept. We trying to get there. We ain't going to get there till it's coming, which is Pentecost. Go ahead. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, that he might be the firstborn. Firstborn from what? Firstborn from the dead. The first fruits. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Matter of fact, I'm going to throw this in there. Go back to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. And pick it up at verse... Uh, Thirteen. Colossians 1 and 13. Go ahead. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness uh -huh. and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. See, so you're talking about thank the father who done done this. Go ahead. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Uh-huh. Even the forgiveness of sins. Even the forgiveness of sins. Go ahead. Who is the image of the invisible God. Uh-huh. The firstborn of every creature. Oh, the firstborn. The first fruits, the firstborn. First fruits of them that slept. The firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn of every creature. That's what this thing is about. What does it mean? It means he was born in the beginning sometime? No. Nope. It's talking about when he came up out the grave. The first fruit from the dead. Go ahead. 16. Mm -hmm. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, mm -hmm. visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him 
and for him. Go ahead. And he is before all things, mm -hmm. and by him all things consist. Go ahead. What else is he? And he is the head of the body. This is Jesus. It's all Jesus. This thing is all about Jesus. You can't get to Pentecost without him. Go ahead. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And we know exactly, we got a date for that, brother and sister, when he was the firstborn from the dead. And we can't get to Pentecost except he come out the grave. That's the only way to Pentecost is through him coming out the grave because it's about the first fruits. It wasn't about nothing else. Only reason we use the Passover because that's the date stamp of when he died. But in this instance, we're not worshiping the Passover. We celebrated that seven weeks ago. We worship in him, his resurrection, the first fruits. We're acknowledging that, and that's how we get to Pentecost. That's what this whole thing is about. And we know he came out three days and three nights after he died on the Passover. He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That what? That in all things he might have the preeminence. See, he got preeminence in all things. That's good. Revelation 19. And we got one more, and we, this will be it. Show you this thing is all about Christ. That's, if you, that's why the Edomites don't understand the so-called Jews because they call themselves going to do it according to the law. You can't do it according to the law. You don't acknowledge the lawgiver. He established in the law. So when you follow Jesus, how are you going to tell me I'm wrong when I'm acknowledging exactly what Jesus did and that's what this thing is about? Well, see, y'all adding three days and three nights. I ain't added. Jesus gave me that. I didn't make that up. Jesus wanted you to know he was going to be in the grave for three days and three nights. He gave you a time when he become the first fruits. He did not become the first fruits on Passover or else we'd be using Passover as a time. He became the first fruits three days and three nights later. 19 and 9, go ahead. Revelation 19 and 9, go ahead. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh-huh. And he saith unto me, Go ahead. These are the true sayings of God. Uh-huh. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Mm -hmm. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Worship God. And what is the testimony of Jesus? Go ahead. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, it's one and the same. See, Jesus brought testimony, brothers and sisters, about what he said, him and the disciples. They brought testimony. All that he said and did is testimony of the law. So they go together like a hand and a glove go together. That's why he turned around and said, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So Jesus is in line with the law. It lines up. That's why he came and died on the Passover just like it was written. That's why he came and resurrected three days and three nights later. Because he had to come out and be the first fruit. That's when he became the first fruits. Three days and three nights later. To lead us to Pentecost. That's why it was exactly 50 days later. When he was accepted on that first day of the week after he had resurrected. But you can't. Then it was 50 days later till they had that Pentecost in Acts the second chapter. But you can't start counting until he resurrected brothers and sisters. That was the key. Anything else, you're going outside of Christ. Now, let's go to uh, 1 Kings 12. And look at this to show you sometimes brothers got to be careful because either, either way it's dangerous, whether it's a lack of knowledge or you just trying to come up with something for your own means. You have to be careful because when you start misleading people in the word, it's, it's a dangerous thing. Like this brother did. The Lord had blessed him to be over Israel, the ten tribes. But in his zeal to be more than he was or to be somebody, he started, he came up with something else to call himself solidify, solidifying his position. And why you got to solidify, solidify something 
that the Lord already gave you. Why do you have to solidify that? If the Lord gave it to you, it's yours. You ain't got to worry about it. That's why whatever the Lord had me do, if that's what the Lord want me to do, I don't have to worry about somebody else taking my position or whatever because it's whatever the Lord want. I don't have to even worry about that. If that's what the Lord got for me and want me to do it or whatever, I don't have to worry about that. I don't even, I don't even get in the Lord's business like that. 1 Kings 12 and 26. But when you start operating with your own mind, you start making moves based on your own, your, your own aspirations and what you want. Then it's no longer about the Lord. So I'm just showing you how and why sometimes brothers be coming up with stuff that they don't need to come up with because they want to be more than they are. It's not about feeding the sheep and edifying people. Because some of this stuff these brothers that came up with since I've been in the Word, hey, it, didn't, it don't do nothing but cause confusion. It, it was no need for them to run off and just make something up when they already knew the way it was. Just like this, brother, 1 Kings 12 and 26. Go ahead. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Uh-huh. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. See, he, he got his own agenda here. See, he thinking with his flesh instead of letting God be in control. First of all, the, the man didn't have good sense. Reason why I say he didn't have good sense because the Lord brought a prophet to the man and said, look, take, he ripped his garment that he had. He had a new garment on. I knew that got his attention. He had a brand new garment. The prophet came and ripped it off of him and ripped it into 12 pieces and said, here, take 10. This, is tell, this, is, this was a sign that the Lord going to put you over you're going to be over the 10 tribes of Israel once the nation split. It was one nation before that time. He didn't know nothing about this. He had a little, he had a little uh, skills, but still, this came to him from a prophet, said, you take these 10 pieces, you over 10 tribes. So look, if, if the Lord didn't put you over 10 tribes, why all of a sudden you got to be smart enough to make sure you keep it? And the Lord didn't put you over 10 tribes. But this is what he's trying to do. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes brothers get on their own. They try to get real wise and come up with something instead of just sticking with the gospel. That's what he did. So now he's thinking with his flesh. He, Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom shall return to the house of David. Because the Lord took ten tribes from David's house and gave it to him. And he only gave two tribes to Rehoboam. That was the answer but now he worried about oh they gonna leave me they gonna leave me and go up look if that happened that must be from the Lord but you ain't got to worry about that if this people go to do sacrifice so now he worried about them going to do sacrifice in Jerusalem which is what the Lord commanded instead of falling in line with what the Lord commanded he said they gonna turn and go back to real born king of Judah and they shall kill me and go again to real born king of Judah. How that's going to happen when the Lord then made you this, gave you this position? But go ahead, 28. I'm sorry, we're going to skip to 32. But that's what's on his mind. So he came up with a solution. What was his solution? Go ahead, 32. 32. Mm -hmm. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month. <laughs> oh, he, to, to get it, because he got his own agenda now, he going to make up another feast. See, this seems like it ain't no big stuff. But this is serious business. And he got his own agenda for doing this. And it seemed like, well, you know, they do it in the seven months. We're going to do it a little different. Why? The Lord set the standard. Just like I said for, for brother, if you've been doing it 10, 15 years, you better make darn sure you got it right before you start changing. Because you didn't already say, well, this is right the time I've been doing it. So now all of a sudden, 
he going to come up with a new one. He ordained a feast in the eighth month on what day? On the 15th day of the see, month. See, you got to be careful. Not saying the Lord can't show nobody something new, but you had to make sure they didn't show them something. They had to be able to prove it. Sometimes people just going against the grain, just to go against the grain. Like in this case, Lord has showed him nothing, but a lot of people followed him. This is the key. Israel is following him. This thing is a great sin. That's why when you over some people, you in great jeopardy. He ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month. Like what? Like unto the feast that is in Judah. Uh-huh. And he offered upon the altar. Now, he called himself worshiping God. Just got a new feast day to do. Oh, it ain't much different. You know, we just doing it this way. But really, in his mind, he just, he just want to, he worried about losing the people. Go ahead. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. Uh-huh. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Go ahead. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel uh -huh. the 15th day on the 8th month. The 15th day, just a month later. Like we got a brother this year, he kept the feast a month earlier than us. You know, and he's, he's swearing up and down. He right, but look, you the one change, you... You need to show some proof. And like I told him, I said, you're going to be way out of season in no time. you never seen the Passover being kept in the dead of winter. Nowhere in the Bible. So he said, this guy did it. He came up with a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month. Even what? Even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. See, sometimes people devising things of their own heart. And they haven't taken enough time to make sure. Just like, see, the Lord give you teachers for a reason. See, that's why I didn't run off from my teachers and just act like, oh, they dumb. They don't know nothing. No, I didn't do nothing because I know I had learned from them. That's why I still talk to them to this day. If I have some questions about something, I don't have no problem because I'm not nobody. So I don't have no problem calling either one of my teachers, any of them, and talking to them about certain scriptures. Therefore, hey, you ain't going to run off half cock making up stuff, stuff up. And I, I'm not trying to be somebody so great where I come up with something on my own. Because it shouldn't be about you. It should be about sp spreading the gospel and reaching lost souls. So, but that's what he did. He devised, he came up with a new feast even in the month which he devised of his own heart and did what? And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. Go ahead. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. See, he, he, now it looked like you worshiping God still. But hey, he doing his own thing now. He even got out of line. And that's what's going on to this day. So I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. We had a regular announcements also. Well, we know... At sundown, Saturday night, after the end of the weekly Sabbath, seventh day, we're going to go into, that'll be the 50th day. So we, this is the seventh Sabbath since Jesus would have been weighed, accepted by the Father. This is the seventh Sabbath since that time. See, you can't do it no other way. So this is the seventh Sabbath since the first fruits, which is Christ would have been accepted for the, by the Father for us to get us to Pentecost, which would be the next day, which is Sunday. So we'll be at the usual time, and every, you know, all our other camps got the time that they're going to keep it. Of course, uh, right now we're not doing nothing in Indianapolis or Cincinnati, so some of them going to come here to celebrate it with us here. And uh, only other place we keep it at besides our, places where we have physical builders is uh, Las Vegas. They're going to keep it in Las Vegas at the hotel because they got, enough, uh, they got enough people there to do it. So, but other than that, Indy and uh, Cincinnati can come here and celebrate it with us. We're going to be here at 1 o'clock. We're going to start at 1, so we need to be here early between noon and 12.30 to get situated with the food and all of that. And we're going to celebrate this great day of Pentecost and we'll have a lesson to deal with it uh, at that time. So with that said, 
we have the uh, regular announcements. And we try to do some sometime for these holy days when we can. I think one year, well, we got the calendars up here. But we, we got some, uh, those that's here tonight, since you're out here tonight, you can get one of these hats. We got some hats. We're supposed to get some T-shirts, but them brothers still, they never do that. Just like I'm waiting on this thing to be put up here. It's supposed to be a, a projector screen put up here. Just like we can't get here on time on Friday night, so we, we start late all the time because we don't have brothers showing up to get things cracking. But now we had a regular announcement. But we got some hats that we want because we like to try to, uh, you know, do something special for these holy days because they are special. So anybody's interested, we're not charging nothing. You can, like anything else, you, just, you can make a donation, whatever you choose. But go ahead. Our prayer is that the eyes of your understanding were enlightened by today's lesson. DVDs and CDs of all our lessons are available. Please place your order in the offering box along with your donation, and pick your DVDs and CDs up at the podium next Sabbath. Please tune in to Thy Kingdom Come television program, which airs in various locations. Please join us at our other study classes, question and answer Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central via conference call line uh, 712-432-1620, access code 609-910, also streamed live from our website. ThyKingdomCome7.com. Children's Bible class, ages 4 through 12, every Sabbath at noon. Teen Forum Bible class, ages 13 through 19, every other Sabbath, Saturday at 5 p.m. If you feel you are ready to be baptized, please sign the baptismal list at the podium and or speak with Brother Wayne. Following is the dress code for our services. All clothing should be modest in appearance. Nothing tight-fitting, overly baggy, sagging, or revealing should be worn. Men are to remove hats and all head covering, and women should wear a head covering, such as a hat or scarf, according to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 7. If your young child becomes noisy during the lesson, distracting other members, please remove him or her to the TV monitor area in the rear of the class. Any tithes and or free will offerings should be put in an offering envelope and placed in the offering box near the podium. Pray for our strength as we pray for you. Until next Sabbath, peace. Peace. Okay, with nothing else, we're going to uh, face the rules and close out. Our Father. Our Father. Which art in heaven. Which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give us this day. Our daily bread. Our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And and the power and the glory and the glory forever forever praise the lord praise the lord for he is good for he is good and his mercy endures forever and his mercy endure forever praise the lord god of israel praise the lord god of israel for he is good for he is good and his mercy endures forever and his mercy endure forever these things we pray in jesus name we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. And King of Kings. And King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. Amen.